Okay, good afternoon. I've just returned from my visit to Indonesia and Singapore, a visit that has reinforced the importance of Asia to the future of New Zealand. As you know, increasing our trade and investment with the rest of the world is an important part of the government's plan to build a more productive economy. We need to earn our way in the world. Indonesia is potentially a huge market and important business partner for New Zealand. It's the fourth most populated country in the world and it's our nearest Asian neighbour. Indonesia has just this year ratified the ASEAN Australia New Zealand FTA and as a country we need to make the most of this agreement just as we do with other Asian countries including China. I took a delegation of business leaders with me who found the trip to be very worthwhile. During the visit, Auckland Airport signed an MOU with the airline Garuda, which is an important step towards a direct service between Indonesia and New Zealand. And Fonterra announced it will be opening its first processing plant in Indonesia. At a government-to-government -government level, we signed off on a program for cooperation, geothermal energy, of which Indonesia has huge untapped reserves. The government will also be appointing a trade commissioner to Jakarta, a new position and will add impetus to the job of building business links between Indonesia and New Zealand. My ministers have also been busy during the recess pushing New Zealand's uh, Inks case in many countries. Deputy Prime Minister Bill English led New Zealand's ministerial delegation to the Australian New Zealand Leadership Forum in Sydney a couple of weeks ago. Stephen Joyce, Murray McCulley, Tim Grosser and Craig Foss were all there. You'll know that the next year is the 30th anniversary of CER, a world leading free trade agreement keen to take our already close relationship with Australia in this respect to even further height. The feedback from the forum was particularly positive. Australian business leaders admire New Zealand's encouraging economic policy settings and some are already moving jobs to New Zealand, recognising our competitive advantages around general economic policy direction, the exchange rate, regulations and tax. There has to be positive for jobs and incomes on the side of the Tasman. Stephen Joyce also travelled to Oman, Qatar and Saudi Arabia uh, to raise New Zealand's profile as a destination for international students and to support uh, education companies seeking to grow their businesses in the region. To embrace them, meanwhile, there's a trade mission of 14 companies to Chongqing in, China, in inland China and subsequently attended the G20 trade ministers meeting in Mexico. Uh, this is a rare honour and recognises to a very strong reputation on the international stage. So all this demonstrates uh, this government's commitment to building on our strong trade and investment ties around the world uh, so we can deliver more jobs and higher incomes to New Zealanders. In terms of ministerial activity, uh, tomorrow I'll be in New Plymouth on Wednesday, I'll attend the ANZAC uh, Dawn Service in Auckland and I'll attend the National Service <coughs> here at the War Memorial in Wellington. On Thursday I'm in the southern part of the Northern, uh, Northland Electric and on Friday I have visits in Christchurch. On Saturday and Sunday, I'll be attending the National Party Mainland Conference in Dunedin. Questions? Well, I haven't had any direct discussions with them about it, but uh, they will obviously want to look at the deal, but my expectation is yes, I'll support it. Why have you said anything about the Oh, well, look, I don't remember having the conversations with them. I think at the end of the day, uh, we'll be wanting to present the deal to them, but you know, my sense is if we can conclude a deal, then they will see the same benefits that many New Zealanders will see, which is more jobs, uh, better opportunities uh, for our young people, uh, a good environment to be operating in, and 200,000 extra visitor nights coming from overseas. And I think all of those things make that deal very compelling. As we know, it's unlikely to require taxpayer funds or us running uh, the convention centre again, I think they're all positives. Do you don't see any problems with that? Well, I haven't had, uh, from memory, I can't remember having any detailed discussions with them, but no, I wouldn't expect problems. I mean, providing we can get a deal concluded with Sky City, which is logical, I mean, that's been the process of negotiation now with officials in uh, the Minister of MED's office for some time. Obviously, we've been working hard to make sure it's a good deal for taxpayers, can't just be a good deal with Sky City. But if that's the case, then uh, hopefully we'll get there. Uh, I think it's getting closer, uh, some of us. What do you mean by getting closer? Weeks or? I don't know exactly. I mean, as the minister said yesterday, he's always reluctant to put a date on these things because it weakens the government's negotiating. You say unlikely to require taxpayer funds. I thought it couldn't require taxpayer funds to government to Well, there's always a range of options, but our preferred option is we don't have to put taxpayer funds in. You still will go ahead with it because there's a requirement? Well, let's wait and see. My preferred option is we don't have to put taxpayer funds in. Well, is it a dollar that you haven't done a study law on? Any social impact or harm from a 
increase the amount of protein genetic spicy. So to weigh that up, that again, that's for the economic benefits that you say we're coming in. We've done a feasibility study on the, the overall economic benefits of a convention centre and what that showed uh, was that there are real benefits for the region and for the country but they're not all captured in one place which is the convention centre and that's the reason why these things never generally wash their face and that's what we've seen around the world. In terms of poking machines and the impact of that, well the good news part of this story is there'll be less poking machines in New Zealand, not more, so the economic or the social impact is Less impact, not more impact. Well, but there's going to be fewer poking machines anyway. Because, I mean, that, that's a great story, anyway. then, isn't it? But you're, you're going to put it more into the walk of the casino, and so you'd be even fewer if it were to be Maybe or maybe not. All I can tell you is to be less than the rest of the day. How many jobs do you estimate for the community? About 800 for time and, and part time, and about 900 for trade. So there was um, the, the Herald actually did an interesting comparison over the weekend about trying to convert that show that shows a lot of Herald full-time staff um, for great business. So where do you want this come from? Yeah, ours are advice from the MED Daddy, but you've got to remember the Herald used full-time equivalents. They didn't use casual staff. If you have the combination of full-time and casual, it comes up to 800. They usually get a multiplier effect of some, some order. Again, if you look at Melbourne, Melbourne has about 500 casual staff as I understand. We've been so you're talking about the jobs that relate to the operation of the, the convention centre, about 800. and 900 in construction and the build-up. That's a nice The Melbourne Convention Centre is half-owned by a New Zealand investment fund, which um, you didn't consider uh, as good a, good a bet as uh, Sky City. Can you explain why? I mean, did you get, do you ever get any numbers? From the well, I, well, I think when you say you, you're using that in a royal sense. Um, for a start off, uh, the decision about whether it was uh, decided as a good deal or not was made by MED officials. They looked at all five of the particular proposals. They used a series of assessments to um, make a judgment call, but in the application put in by Infratil, there was no, uh, uh, no recommendation that they would be putting in any funding to so require them to government funding. Did you talk to Lloyd Morrison about Not from memory, no. So, can you see why that? might get the impression that Sky City had the inside running, given that you had discussions with him. But you know, despite Lou Morrison, who did pretty well noted, he was pretty well noted in the business, personally, right into you. Well, firstly, if in theory we had gone down that route, you'd be making the same claims, wouldn't you? You'd say that because I knew Lloyd Morrison and because he contacted me directly, somehow they got the deal. Secondly, um, we went through the process of saying that we wanted a convention centre with quite a number of parties. We also said once you put up your best option, but the government's preferred option is not to put in cash. There was only one bid that came in that position, and that was Sky City. And for that reason, it was a much more superior bid to any of the others. But can you say that categorically, or those other bidders produce <coughs> numbers? Because I think this morning you've said that you've just made it clear that Sky City were the only ones that came up. They were the only ones, yeah. With numbers. But you never saw any numbers from any other bidders. What I saw was a, I didn't look at all of the bits, I got a recommendation, MED handled that process, went through a full and thorough process across a number of criteria, MED came back with a recommendation that said, look, if you want to build a convention centre, um, first we think this is a superior bit on a number of different categories, location, ability to run it, likely to be successful, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, but also it doesn't require government money. So very clearly, the MED advice to you was go with Sky City. Oh, absolutely. The, the long-term jobs that the agency, from what you're saying, will be casual and most likely low pay, won't they? I uh, wouldn't accept that. Um, firstly, I mean, there'll be about 900 jobs of people uh, who construct it and they're not low paid, as we know there's a big range here. Uh, and as say about 800 uh, full-time or casual be a variety of different things. But, I mean, if you take a step back from that, that is the convention centre. And I think you've got to understand why the government's in this position. That is because it wants a national convention centre that, as I said to you, it captures some of the economic benefit at that convention centre, but not all of it. So, I don't know whether you class a 747 or a 777 captain as low paid um, or unskilled, I don't. But they'll be flying the people in from overseas, landing at Auckland Airport. I don't know if you consider a top chef at a major restaurant to be low paid or unskilled, but I don't. Okay. And many of those people will be eating there. In the end, the government wants this for a very clear reason. 
economic growth and jobs. And this will create 200,000 visitor nights at, who spend roughly double what the average um, tourist does at the moment. Now, this is an industry that right back from to 2003 has been arguing that the National Convention Centre is an important piece of infrastructure to grow the tourism sector. As I've said so often last week, there is nothing magical about this, and despite your best efforts, no conspiracy. It's just a simple fact of life that the government wants to see a National Convention Centre, and this might come as a shock to you, but Bill English doesn't have 350 million to give me to build one. But do you agree that a convention centre would be a lot further down the track that you weren't having to go through a, well, close to a year's worth of negotiations? I mean, if you had to just sign someone on rather than moving through this prolonged negotiation, we would have been a lot further along the track by now. Well, A, it's important that there's a good deal for the taxpayer, so a thorough process is important. That's what we're going through at the moment. Secondly, let's go back to 2003. Do you know what the surplus was that year? Do you know what it was in 2004 and 2005 and 2006 and 2007? The answer is a lot of money. And in none of those circumstances, despite all of the feasibility study and all of the economic benefits, they were never built. And the simple facts of life are these things don't make money in isolation. They make money for the overall economy. So yeah, are we being creative looking for a deal? Yes. Is it in Auckland and New Zealand's best interest? Yes. Will there be less poker machines at the end of this transaction over time? Yes. Why did you stop the business case going here? Uh, well, that's pretty simple. Uh, what happened was in 2008 when we got the advice as the incoming minister, uh, we said, yeah, we'll put some money into a feasibility study. There were a number of partners that put in that money. We put in 50000 at the end of that. Um, the officials came back and said, as a result of the feasibility study, you should go ahead and build a convention centre. We think it's a good idea. We'll now do your mock business case if you like. I said, forget about the mock business <coughs> case. Let's go out and see if you want to put up their money. So there was no connection with the Sky City indicating that they were prepared to. Not despite your wildest conspiracies, John? No. Who asked for their money for the feasibility study? I can't remember, but my office can give you. I think it was all Quinn Council and somebody else. The three partners. Did all the other potential bidders know that there were more changes on the table that made perfect evidence, or was that the well, to, to a number of people, we said, look, the government does have a lot of money, so we have to be creative. <coughs> but there are always options. You can put on a big tax, you can put on a departure tax. All of those things have been considered and looked at. My view is this is probably this one. Well, Minister, will the government consider going on asylum to any of the Afghani translators? Well, I think what we'd say is, you know, Obviously, we'll look very closely at that situation, as I think all countries would need to. We wouldn't want to leave people who have been integral in the process high and dry or at risk of their lives. Uh, but equally, we need to have discussions with both our partners and, and the individuals to assess um, the merits of the case. I haven't had any advice on that, but I know that uh, the Minister is going to go and look at that situation. What do you think this idea from a health ministry discussion day that you really want to make the evidence go through by 2020 if make it look at this unfold track? Um, sounds like an awful lot. I mean, the government unashamedly has been wanting to increase the price of cigarettes and take a number of other steps to deter people from smoking, including potentially paying the plain packaging and uh, looking at displays. Happens. And they're all part of an integrated approach to deter people from wanting to smoke. Um, whether we get to $100 a packet and whether that would be sustainable in terms of the black market, I don't know. It seems like it sounds like a big step. What do you make of the US Chamber of Commerce uh, statement that's put out over the weekend uh, raising concerns about this intimate towards infrastructure and Oh, I haven't seen the statement, but the, I have, I've had some oral conversations with the Minister of Trade. And from memory, the things he said to me is that there's nothing in the trade agreements that we currently have that would preclude us from having plain packaging. So in terms of the United States, which is where there's a case currently between Australia and some children are aware, we don't have any to go with the United States. So I haven't had any advice that would support you that we can't undertake plain packaging. They seem to believe that we're undermined in different property rights and could affect future well, I'm sure they were representing the views of their cigarette manufacturers, but whether that's actually correct, that's a very good issue. So when the, um, if the casino is up and running <coughs> in the convention centre, what's the next step? Well, we'll have to look at the details of that. Um, but I think the first thing to do is look at the cost of the facility. Uh, we've got a number of people who are going to be working there. We've got a number of people who are going to be working there. We've got a number of people who are going to be working there. We've got a number of people who are going to be working there. We've got a number of people who are going to be working there. We've got a number of people who are going to be working there. We've got a number of people who are going to be working there. We've got a number of people who are going to be working there. We've got a
You said 800 and full time and part time. Yeah, so that's a total of 800. And just going back to, you're confident that you'll get the support from uh, your, your partners in terms of any legislative changes that are required to result in this deal? Well, we need to take control of it, yeah. Have you, so you don't remember having any conversations yourself with Mr Banks and Mr Dunn? Have any of your colleagues? I don't know. I mean, I, I may have had a conversation with them, but I don't, don't recall it. It may have come up in that confidence and supply just generally negotiating because it's been well and truly in the public domain for a long time. It's possible, but I just honestly don't remember it. Why are you so confident that you have your support at the session to get the session to get the big bank to deal with it? Would you just take it for granted that it's a lap dollars? No, I think because they'll see it as a good deal. I mean, yeah, that, that's, that's why I think. That's why I think most of you this with I mean, as I said to your question the other day, I mean, if you could put up a proposal to New Zealanders that will increase the number of tourists by 200,000 a year, create more jobs, um, have an important piece of infrastructure that's important for the tourism sector, and over time, see less poking machines in New Zealand, I think you'd see, have universal support. Prime oh, Minister, on uh, Mihi Pūrevi and the Algerian custody case, Back in February, Minister Natali said that um, he, he promised a review. Yep. And uh, I'm just wondering if you can tell us where that's at. We haven't seen it yet. Um, I can if you just give me one second. <coughs> but, um, she is. Um, look, the long and short of it is, the long and short is that. She is working, as I understand, with the Algerian authorities at the moment uh, around her status and therefore her capacity to um, um, be able to argue a custody case. She's, she's claiming, um, and her family are claiming, that uh, since the initial intervention back in Feb with uh, MFAT official Barbara Weldon, yep. there has been no assistance from the government. Do you think the government has a role to play in no, the government? That, that's true. I mean, MFAT officials have been actively engaged for quite some time. Um, and they've been documenting papers. I mean, this is, as we've always said, quite a complex situation where uh, basically have two parents tied up in custody dispute, but obviously one of them is an Algerian citizen, and um, and now we're trying to apply Algerian law, which is complex and the as a starting point. So, I, look, New Zealand officials have been doing everything they can, as best we can, in the middle of a custody dispute. What do you think about John Anderson's comments on the Greater New Zealand about Australian troops having been lodges and police? I find them offensive. I mean, you know, we're about to go and, and commemorate uh, in two days' time uh, the Anzac tradition. And um, while I have enormous respect for the New Zealand forces and support the views that the one point they put forward, which is our forces are uh, have and continue to be magnificent in the work that they carry out, um, denigrating the Australians as part of that. Um, analysis I think is appropriate. Do you have a message, Prime Minister, for those Australian soldiers? Well, I, I just regret that those comments because, you know, I, I've seen the Australian forces on a number of situations when they've been in places like Afghanistan and I've seen them uh, in Gallipoli and, and various other places and, you know, the, the spirit of the Anzac tradition is alive and well. Um, that was a, a tradition forged on the battlegrounds in Gallipoli and to take away from their efforts I personally find quite offensive. You, you talked about how you, know, you and other ministers in the United States try to open yeah. to promote trade. And then obviously talked about the need to concern about bringing in more tourists. Um, last week, Russell Norman got bigger some stats about you know, statistically how the state of looking at. Still, the main issue for exporters and tourism is the level of the New Zealand dollar. Yeah. I mean, but I'm just wondering is, is there anything that you can see still that could be done? around the dollar that Firstly, I mean, what the government is doing is trying to take pressure off all manufacturers and exporters through better regulation and better policy, and that certainly helps. So I've always believe we should apply our minds to the things that we can control, and that is business regulation, business tax, all of those issues. Secondly, the, the big issue, uh, or one of the big issues, I think, is that in terms of um, supporting monetary policy, if we run tight fiscal policy, then we take the pressure off the Reserve Bank and we're going to have a pretty much a zero budget on May 24th. And that's another example of where we're supporting monetary policy uh, by taking the pressure off that. So I think that's all really important. 
third thing I just want to say is that yeah, there is while, while I accept you know for non-commodity linked exporters, exchange rate is causing them problems, and we've seen for quite some time now we think the US and New Zealand exchange rates overvalued. I think it's important to put a bit of perspective around it. The high exchange rate takes pressure off oil um, prices, and that's quite a big component of that. The high exchange rate takes pressure off imported inflation, and that takes pressure off the Reserve Bank. That's important. Um, many manufactured goods which are exported have an imported component, and again, the higher exchange rate helps there. So it's not all bad news, but it certainly puts pressure on some. So when you said in Indonesia, the government's considering um, ways to mitigate the risks. I think you've got to read the whole quote. And the whole quote makes it pretty clear that I, I, I don't believe um, an intervention never have and frankly never will. I spent my professional life looking at it and it fails. But you're meaning the existing government policy. I'm talking about all the things I just talked about then. You know, if we if we if we if we go out there and make sure the RMA works properly, employment legislation works properly, tax law is, is functioning properly, all those things are things we're gonna have control. Dreaming that we can somehow get the exchange rate right down through intervention is la 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 and stuff. On the price of farms, there, do you have any concerns that the Shanghai Bank should have registered the first two brand names of the particular one out there? Look, I hadn't seen that they had registered it, um, but obviously you have to make sure they comply with the law. I mean, there have been previous things by other people to use 100% mm -hmm. pure, and my knowledge of that is that they've been um, fought and resisted by, by um, tourism. So if if they were in any way breached and breach of that, then I'm sure Tourism New Zealand would look at that. Well, Tourism New Zealand told me that they registered the 100% pure brand name yeah. for tourism and tourism related businesses, but it was open to other organisations to register other brands. But the pure 100 is pretty clearly designed to either adopt New Zealand's international reputation as a company. I mean, is that something which you're comfortable uh, a Chinese controlled company using New Zealand's tourism marketing money? And, uh, yeah. and, and, the effect of that. Well, the tourism <coughs> tried to close that angle down because they believe that they've, they've properly satisfied any concerns they might have with people that use it in relation to the tourism sector. Probably lots of people use 100% of the pure and different forms and other industries. I don't know, I haven't looked at it, but I'm sure that's the case. All I can tell you is that the very protective people gets to anywhere near the tourism sector and marketing and things. Well, I mean, in this case, it's a, it's a company. A, uh, Russell Rawl has, has raised the issue of what happens if there's a scandal, a melanin type, type scandal um, involving milk products in China. And that product has got a brand name Pure 100, which associates with New Zealand. Aren't we risking our international branding? No, I think so. I mean, look, there was always that risk. Actually, that there was um, a, a much bigger issue when Fonterra was the uh, part owner of San Lu, and there was a melanin scandal. Uh, actually, what the international markets did was pretty quickly differentiate between a New Zealand source product and a Chinese source product. Um, and certainly, in the case of New Zealand, which is the company that we're talking about, as you know, there's 27 conditions sitting around the Crayford Farms um, bit, and one of those includes that they can't be perfectly integrated. So, the probability of things like the mainland scandal are certainly much, much lower in New Zealand than mine. <laughs> Well, you don't ask them that. What's your view on it? Well, my, my view is that the motivations of uh, China wanting to tap into New Zealand's food supply are pretty clear. You know, they're becoming much wealthier. Uh, New Zealand product is world class, and the logic behind them wanting to be able to tap into that resource is, is apparent for anyone. Um, you know, I, I think they are going to prove to be you know, probably our most crucial market when it comes to food supply, just the sheer development of that economy. Would you, sorry, do you think that, just to shift the focus a little bit, do you think that the, um, the rules around the OIO, the rules that the OIO considers, particularly in terms of that with or without scenario yeah. that they look at, do you think those, they need addressing? Because reading through the um, report they issued last week, they were taking into account things like um, Shanghai Pension's uh, promises to the environment, you know, the Mali um, one company, that kind of stuff. Well, those are, it's hard, you can hardly do a with or without analysis of those because there is no New Zealand um, bidder who's promising to do that and no requirement on them to do it. Yeah, so I'm not a lawyer and, and I'll just catch my comments in that regard, but if, I think if you go and look at Justice Miller's ruling, 
um, what he actually says when, he's, when he says you look at the with and without, is he also is quite clear that it's not a requirement on the terms of the minister. He says the ministers will on the that's also in COIO to actually um, model that counterfactual bit. He says you just have to consider what that counterfactual bit might be. It's not specific. Um, that's my understanding of it anyway. Uh, in terms of the overall legislation, <coughs> um, there's always a degree of judgment in there. The OAO and ministers are required to, to make an assessment across a lot of different categories. And I think they've done their best to assess that given the information that they have. It's not perfect, um, but it's as good as it can be. So did that back at specificity and that, that High Court ruling really allow um, the um, commission application to proceed? Because if it's a good faith, you see how you consider that being on the vote. So no, I'm just saying, what, what is a little bit different is that the before and after test is reasonably easy to quantify. Mm -hmm. Um, the with or without test asks you to consider a notion of counterfactual bit which actually isn't there and how you construct that bit. The, the judge in his ruling says it's actually not the necessary ingredient to actually go and spell all that out. Now, quite how you assess that is for others to look at. I mean, there was a comment around Rosford about whether there would be as much uh, public interest if it hadn't been a Chinese bit because obviously we had German explicit first by very hard. But for that piece of strategic sense that China is really looking to get into the gearing as you hear, I mean, would that create a bit of a worry if there was a real Chinese demand to buy a whole lot more time? Well, look, I think my, my own view is that um, we'd welcome Chinese investment in New Zealand just like we you know, welcome investment from a number of countries. But personally, I'd rather channel that investment into processing and moving up the value chain. I think it's a straight transfer of selling huge tracts of New Zealand land is not overly in our interest. My main point has been I don't think that's actually happening at this point. I mean, if you go back to about 2005, 2006, there's been over 800,000 hectares of land sold. And prior to the Craper Farm sale to Shanghai Pingjin, there have been 223 hectares sold. So I think, you know, that it's more a perception <coughs> than a reality. Now, if that perception turns into reality, the government might want to go back and address that position. That's not what we're currently facing. Do you think people might be more concerned about China being opposed to, say, Germany or Switzerland and those types of purchases? Because China is, as you say, is a massive population of development and may well be a country that needs to be security as opposed to the other ones. So, you know, people are a bit worried about their motivations in, in comparison to those other countries. Well, I think what is true, if you look at China as the capacity to buy Central amounts of land or to invest anyway is um, unquestioned. I mean, they have nearly four trillion dollars in, in reserves, and they clearly have strong motivation in terms of one and a half billion people in the country. So they've got a lot of interest. Um, but I don't think that is going to convert to massive sales of land um, to Chinese buyers. And all we've, the government said the whole way through this process is we just need to be consistent. We think that there's too much land being sold to foreigners, irrelevant of their ethnicity, then the government may look to tighten up the rules. At this point, because we've been selling at a much slower rate than the labour was, um, I think the are arguing probably in reasonable shape. If that, if that dynamic changes, then the government reserves right. The Chinese industry itself said, for a lot of Chinese investors, are looking at this application, and basically, if it gets the government here, it's going to pique the interest of a, of a whole, you know, a lot of other investors. So, you know, it, it, Pressure may well increase, demand may well increase, and is that scenario that they'll get to that stage? They need to themselves, it'll you know, probably spur a lot of interest in New Zealand land. Well, I think, let's see. Um, yeah, I, I think what the Chinese would have been looking for is consistency. And if the answer was no um, in the Craper Farms deal, I think they'd be totally comfortable with that, as long as the answer would be no for any time in time. Um, whether, whether the fact that some people might be looking at that deal means that necessarily going to go and buy land is a very different issue. Maybe they're just looking at the way we might assess the investment. For instance, when Labor um, turned down the Canadian pension plan deal to buy into a port from the airports, there was a lot of commentary in the business in the um, media that that really deterred investment in New Zealand because there was a very unclear picture of where the foreign investment was welcome. It didn't mean it was all going to go into the airport. So I don't think the mystery of drawing the dots of the audience is going to be underlined. The NBD paper that was released last year, I think, talks about um, uh, 
countries other than China for investors who've been looking scarce at the, the, the delays or whatever else, um, and have been holding back on investments. It doesn't actually list those, but are you aware of, of um, any companies from overseas that have been holding back on investments? Is, is that the that? impact these from Murray McCulley to Morris Williams? Yeah, it's the paper investor. Yeah, okay, sure. Um, look, I haven't had sense of conversations with them about that. Uh, I'm sure there are lots of people around the world looking at this. I mean, uh, I think within New Zealand there will be a lot of people looking to see how, how the OIO government handles this. I mean, ultimately when you get a landmark ruling as we got from Justice Miller, then lots of people will take you know, passing interest in that, see what it might mean. What's intended for the 10% discount for elderly on the winter? How much is it going to be the budget? Do you have any chance of getting that? Uh, in a word, no. Um, I mean, look, if you go and have a, have a look at what we've done, uh, I'll tell you the, the, we have, in the, in the time that we've been in office, essentially from one April 2008, so slightly before we came in, to now, if you count the increase that's going to go through in one April 2012, increased the pension by $194 per couple per fortnight. That's an increase of 22%. So, I'd be first to acknowledge that some pensioners that find it difficult to pay the power bill. But I think the government's been doing a good job of trying to keep these on super up. Secondly, Winston Peters was part of a government that saw uh, energy prices rise by 72% over the period that uh, Labour were in office, some period of which they were with Winston Peters. And the entire time Winston Peters was with that Labour government, I don't recall them ever giving pensioners a 10% uh, reduction in their power bills. So maybe he owes an apology for what he did in terms of supporting Labour uh, back from 2005 to 2008. I look forward to hearing the apology. <laughs>